So we're going to start out with this uh, chair model um, that uh, may get used in the subway at some point. And I am kind of analyzing a little bit the, the meshes and, and uh, various items that make up the object in the beginning. It's a useful thing to do just to figure out what you have before you start doing it. Uh, now the easiest thing to do is to add a lattice and do some global changing so that um, so that you can basically um, have things sag over time and you can have the same kind of sagging applying to everything uh, so that they kind of stay fitting together all the time and we can go in and add detail later on so um, you just need to have it kind of envelop, envelop all your objects about the same uh, bounding boxes all of them uh, add enough divisions and then add a basis key and then an extra key on top of that um, that key is going to be your sag key uh, now I'm adding the lattice modifier to one of the objects it doesn't actually matter which one I do first and uh, once I have that I can select all of them and copy the modifier over um, I'm using the uh, uh, the uh, copy attributes menu um, add-on that makes that kind of easy to do. Um, so now that we've done that we can add um, our f start editing our first shape key. I'm just gonna basically tweak it to have a reasonable amount of sag uh, that would look um, a little bit uh, believable uh, in, in front of the camera. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it helps to kind of imagine um, how time would affect things. So for instance this particular pole is not supported in the middle um, so you can imagine it would sag the most there and I'm just making sure that the tops don't look like they stretch as the pole is sagging down so just moving them down a bit and um, thinking of the chairs like since the side chairs get some use might need to pull them down a little bit individually and create that kind of uh, feeling that different chairs are being sat on by people so they're not like we don't miss some and cause some other ones to sag. Um, and so once the shape key has been um, made, uh, we need to actually start driving it. Um, uh, when this gets get linked into a scene, it's going to be a single uh, empty, um, and we need to use a proxy for a rig to make it actually animatable by the person doing the animation in the shot. Um, so for this purposes, we're gonna add an armature and that armature is going to have a single bone that represents the process progress of time. So as we're animating in our scene here, we're going to actually scrub time by moving that bone rather than scrubbing time by actually scrubbing in the timeline. So just renaming that bone to time and um, picking an axis that it's going to move on. That's why I'm switching to normal coordinates here so I can see which one I'm using and I'm using the X axes and I'm just gonna slide it over in edit mode so that it's kind of out of the way so it's easy for us to see and grab and so that's our time bone. So now let's add a first driver and we're gonna add this driver to the lattice um, and we're gonna add to the sag shape key that we created earlier um, just by hitting D um, with our mouse hovering over the property and then we can go to the curves editor which will be in quite a bit and we'll switch that over to drivers and we can select that new driver and then we can plug in um, I'm going to delete the modifier because we don't need it and then we can plug in the um, the bones uh, position X position there so I'm just select the rig select the bone and change that to local or transform space it actually doesn't matter in this case which one we use and I'm just going to use the average value um, so that it just increases as the bone moves in X and so now we have our little sag um, driven. So that's the first bit of driven animation that we have in this rig. Now just having the whole thing sag together is not going to give us enough variation. So it's time to start thinking about um, like actually making the chairs do individual things rather than having everything go all together at once. Um, and they're all kind of linked objects and they have a mirror modifier and an array. They're basically a half chair. And since I don't want to keep that symmetry too much, I'm going to apply all those modifiers and leave the subsurf um, on. 
but I'm going to apply everything else and uh, you need to single user them before you can apply modifiers. So we're going to add some bones and we're going to use those as pivots um, for the chairs to pivot around that point. point. So they already snapped to the center of that. Just give them nice names so that we can um, easily uh, select them later on. And I'm just going to duplicate them one for each chair. Just sliding them along the x-axis there. And I'm going to pretty up the names a little bit so that they all have kind of some consistency. So now that that's there, uh, we can simply um, select um, one of these bones and then shift select. Whoops. Uh, we can select one of these bones and then we can shift select the mesh. Um, and then we can basically um, create a hook modifier to that selected bone. And let's do that again. So hook modifier to selected bone. And you're going to see me do this a bunch of times. So And notice that jumped over there because the hook modifiers for bones need to get reset once you apply them or you get jumping. And you should move them above the lattice um, in this case. That's important. So the rotation happens before the sagging. Um, and they continue to visually appear that they're rotating around the pole. So I'm doing the same thing for the chairs now. Um, except I'm going to remember to hit reset. And in certain cases, the modifier stack adds the hook to the top of the stack, and in certain cases, it adds it to the bottom. Um, I don't know what's up with that. Um, but you can also select the correct bone from the menu. You don't have to pop out of edit mode and back in um, if you don't want to. So now you can see I can rotate these chairs um, and around swiveling them around that pole um, which is kind of what I want and um, I kind of only want them to rotate in the x-axis um, no biggie um, we can do that um, and um, we want it to happen over time obviously um, so we're we gonna have to drive that in a moment um, so now you're just gonna keep on going ahead and adding the same modifier to those other objects so it's just going to be a little bit of, of the same. Select, add the hook to selected bone, reset, do it again. There we go. So now we're all set up. Everything can rotate. We can test that just to make sure. And so now they're sagging. And you notice the rotation stays around the pole because of the modifier stack order having the hook. Above. So now we need to actually get these bones driven by the time uh, slider, which is a bone as well. And we don't want to add a driver for this because driving a bone with a bone um, in the same rig doesn't work very well. Um, and what you need to do is add a transformation constraint, which actually is just about the same thing as a driver. Determine that we want the location to drive the rotation. And uh, we want it to be in local space so that it just isn't based on the world position, but the local position of the bone. Then we're going to add some limits. So we know that time is going from 0 to 1 as we slide that bone, you know, 1 being the end of time and for this particular thing, and, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Switch it to Euler because I don't even need to, to rotate in more than one axis. But it doesn't really matter because the transformation constraint is going to do everything we need. Um, so if I make the minimum max rotation 0, 1, I can make the minimum max rotation, for instance, 15 degrees. And now it, that chair is going to rotate as it sags. So we're already getting a little bit of in the visuality. And we can also copy that constraint to the other three we, using the copy attributes menu. And bang, that's there. And we can go and vary the parameters of each constraint. Um, pretty much randomly, um, just so that they don't start and stop and move the exact same amount each. So there's a little bit of variation. Each chair is slightly different in how it sags. So just going ahead and doing that um, will give it a little bit more life.
so now the now that we have the transformations kind of smoothly moving it would be nice to have one chair that kind of jumps in position as if it's like been violently twisted um, at some point in its in its life um, so we're going to do that by adding a uh, copy rotation constraint so basically like you can do it by transforming it but then you have to deal with the curves being stepped or not stepped or whatever right and we know that drivers are kind of an issue with bones the nice thing about constraints is that they just get a nice little influence slider and that is drivable um, even within the same armature and the other thing that's nice about that is that um, uh, you know, it can jump from zero to one, and I'll show you how to set that driver up in a moment. Uh, we're going to use an expression uh, with a greater than um, in it. So, first of all, we have to create the bone. So, we're going to pop into edit mode on the armature, and we can, uh, since it's going to be a rotation thing, I'm just going to like rotate the, like duplicate the bone and then rotate it around the cursor. So, um, don't actually have to do that since we're just going to copy the rotation. So it's just a visual thing here. So, and I'll just rename it and pop out of edit mode again. And um, so here, this one already has that transformation constraint. So we can add a copy rotation constraint on top um, and same principle and now it's on you can see it swivels down and we have this influence slider that we can change whether it's on or off and what I'm going to do is hit D over that to create a driver and then if we go into our drivers and we select that particular driver um, you can see that it has the um, it needs to first of all we need to actually add our variable in which is the time bone call it time just because it's nicer and then we're gonna go to our scripted expression and we're gonna write time greater than some value um, 0.5 in this case so that means it's gonna be 0 until time is greater than 0.5 and it's gonna jump to 1 so that's basically how you can get instantaneous changes um, in drivers um, so you can go from like a value A to value B very quickly. You can do that for things that aren't um, constraints as well. Um, just be aware that it's going to jump to from 0 to 1 by default, so you might have to actually multiply the result by some number to get like the numbers that you actually want. But for constraints, you don't have to do anything. Um, same goes for shape keys and anything that's kind of on-off, um, whether it's something that has a slider or a, or a Boolean. Uh, checkbox. They'll all work the same way. Um, so that's kind of cool. So now we have a bunch of chairs that rotate and a bunch of and one chair that just kind of jumps. And now it's kind of nice if we um, have one of the chairs get removed. Um, and the way we can do that is by adding a um, vertex group to it that will select that chair. And we can add a mask modifier. And the mass modifier can take that vertex group um, as a argument. I like to put it, push it above the subsurf at least so that it doesn't have to work with so many vertices. And uh, here the invert is necessary to make it um, select that thing. So that chair can disappear and we can add the driver to the visibility of the mask and edit it in much the same way um, to, use the, um, to use the bone as a target. Um, you can speed up your, your, your workflow a little bit by copying the driver over from another thing that you've already made and then editing it rather than, you know, creating a new driver and editing from scratch. And it's the same kind of expression. Frame over a certain value will turn this on. Now we can copy and paste it because we really care more about the rendering visibility than the viewport visibility, of course. And, um just checking to see that it worked. And now as I move that to the beginning and to the end, it disappears after a certain amount of time. So we kind of lost the chair as this thing is aging.
So I'm going to go over to the shapes. I'm going to add a basis. I'm going to add a little kind of deformation shape key. And um, uh, using proportional edit mode is useful here um, so that you can have a bunch of verts move at the same time. So um, kind of imagine somebody sitting on the chair a lot and making it sag underneath them or, you know, whatever, stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to add, like, basically move that middle down with proportional editing and make that chair look like it's sagging a bit. And we can sag the back. And we can, you know, we can be, um, you know, we can be extreme or uh, mild as we like. Uh, the important thing is to try to use the shape keys to give each chair its slightly different, um, slightly different look. So it looks a little bit less procedural, especially since the shape key is only one shape key in this case. Um, you could do two. So they're going to actually like progress at the same time. So if you do identical deformation with identical timing, it's going to look... Uh, too similar, so I just want to make sure that they're not exactly that. And finally, we add the driver, and it's much the same thing. We're going to use the average value instead of the scripted expression. See here, I just pasted that driver right on there and switched it to average value, which really saves a lot of time. And now, if I drag that bone across, that shape key is going to start manifesting itself over time. Um, which is kind of nice. Let's do the same thing to the other two chairs. Um, just add another shape key and, you know, go to town. Um, like, and I can use a scripted expression to make it progress not quite at the same rate as the other one. So if I subtract something from time, um, it will actually start from zero because the um, shape key is limited to go from zero to one. Uh, but it'll start a little bit later. So this one won't actually start deforming with the other two chairs. They'll start a little bit later um, just to give a slight um, variation um, to the, you know, so that not everything is timing at the same time. It gives it like a little bit more of a staccato feel that um, is kind of acceptable acceptable when you're doing something that's time lapsey that you kind of feel like these event discrete events happen at moments in time and gives a slightly staccato feel to things um okay so the thing about the disappearing chair is that we haven't done anything about making doing anything with the bottom part of that chair and what would be cool is if it falls off at some point and ends up on the ground um, uh, presumably at some point after the uh, the chair itself is disappeared. So I'm going to basically hook it to an empty. And we can just move that empty where we want the thing to have fallen to. And we can rotate it, do whatever we want with it. Um, so there we go. And another thing we have to be careful about with all these extra objects, the rig, the hook, and the um, lattice, is that they all have to be in the same group um, as you know the chairs. So you can just select them and do Control Shift G, and that will make sure that they live in the same group and they get linked in um, together. Um, so now that we've done that, we can play with the uh, driving the hook modifier. So just add a driver, and you know scripted expression again. But we can change when it happens. You know just just so that we don't have everything happen at the same time. Copy and paste it. And now we have this thing falling. And what's kind of nasty here is that because it has the other hook and it has the lattice modifier on it active, um, after it folds, uh, it continues to move um, as if it's sagging. Uh, and clearly we don't want that, so we want to disable um, some of those modifiers so we could disable the lattice just by pasting that and reversing um, reversing the sign from a greater than to a less than uh, so that that's only active before it falls um, and here I kind of screwed up a little bit because I picked the, diff the wrong modifier um, so it took me a moment to realize that only one of the hooks needs to be disabled so leaving the lattice in the end because it doesn't affect it once it falls out of the lattice and adding the uh, driver to the second hook modifier that gets the 
correct um, the correct chair. So the uh, lesson here is to uh, drive the correct modifier, which becomes less and less trivial as you have more modifiers on the stack. So uh, also like it would be good to correct these shape keys so we don't get penetrations. Something I didn't notice the first time I did this. So it's just a matter of going into edit mode and tweaking one or two verts at most. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. This one's getting some interpenetration from the geometry behind it. And the thing is, it's not quite visible in edit mode. So I'll turn on some of the modifiers. I still can't quite see it, um, but I'm just going to move, just move that point out. That should be fine. Actually looks kind of cool. Looks kind of like a plastic damage happening there. So that's cool. Um, now, final thing that would be nice is if maybe that piece that fell on the ground uh, gets removed after some time so it doesn't just stay there. So um, so we can add that. So let's make this disappear. And we can do this by adding a mask modifier once again. If it was a single object, we could just animate its visibility directly in the outliner or rather drive it in much the same way. Um, so I'm just going to have it disappear a little bit, a few frames after it falls. Paste that on. And mass cell was tricky because you have to get the vertex groups right. So as you can see, adding the mass modifier without creating a vertex group first doesn't do anything. You have to create that group and then use it in your mass modifier. So that's basically it for this first uh, tutorial video. Um, we'll do a few more um, over time. So I'll do a couple of other ones um, and we'll do slightly more complex things or slightly different things really. They're not really that much more complex, but we'll do just different things that you can do. Um, next time I'll go over, um, I'll either go over animating wires or I'll go over using um, one of the scripts that lets you use particles um, in your time lapse to um, instantiate objects. And we'll uh, see how that goes. Cool. Bye bye.